Recording is on, yes. Hi. And then we're going to switch over and go go live on Facebook. I assume willing. So uh, we're, we're going to do chapter 22 in Isaiah today. Say for Yeshaya. Our uh, group text is the Milstein edition of Isaiah. But um, any Masoretic uh, translation of Tanakh is easy to follow along with. So there was a significant uh, tragedy in Israel. Uh, the um, uh, during uh, Lagba Omer at the uh, in Maron itself. So, uh, you know, God runs the world. God knows what he's doing. And sometimes a, uh, an unfortunate... Um, sometimes an unfortunate... Uh, well, an unfortunate event sometimes occurs so that um, the rest of the world can grow from it. Sometimes people are taken when they've already managed in a short time to, to fulfill their mission. And, um, and it's just a difficult thing that when, it, when it occurs, but we have to trust in God that he knows what he's doing and um, his mercy is still upon us. Even though it was a horrible tragedy, we can still make the world a better place. The Gemara teaches that a person has capacity to change the world based on the commandment of don't leave a stumbling block for the blind. Um, and um, uh, I'll, and uh, don't stand idly by the blood of your fellow, and of course, uh, love for, for a fellow. All of these factors indicate that we shouldn't leave a danger out there. And if we leave a danger there, it's, we, we can't really blame God for that. Uh, if this is discussed in um, the Gemara Kusubos uh, uh, on page 30. Uh, look at the Rashi and Tosos there. Uh, so, unfortunately, the, the tragedy could have been prevented, and there were people who warned that it could happen, and it still wasn't fixed. So, the, the most bitter tragedy is when God tries to tell us to stop and, and fix it, and we don't listen. That, that's, that's the most bitter tragedy of all. Um, you know, in a sense, it's almost a natural reaction because if a if a child was walking in the street and the parent was say, yeah, you know, don't go in the street. It's it's a bad idea with all those cars. But they didn't explain that the cars could really hurt the person, the child. So then it's it's understandable the child might be uh, feel betrayed by by the um, the tragedy. But when God put it in our hands, when uh, a reporter two and a half years ago wrote about this uh, and, and mentioned about the, um, the danger there, and that in that evening before anyone died, the deputy mayor of uh, Jerusalem was in attendance and he warned the police that people are going to die if they don't do something. And even the deputy mayor was ignored. Uh, so, you know, it's it's understandable to have a reaction that, why didn't you warn me more? Okay, you warned me and you warned me, but why didn't you warn me more? Because it was such a horrible thing. You had to reveal to me how bad it could have gotten. 
but these things are already known to people. There are experts who you just whisper something like this. They already understood there was going to be danger and people didn't react. And this is the problem. It's, it's, this tragedy is, is horrific. And many horrors in history have been the choice of humans, negligence, passivity in, in the face of someone else's danger. Uh, the, these are the sort of things that have led to the very worst tragedies in human history. And the first reaction of some people is to blame God and God is innocent. He knew it was going to happen and he sent people to mourn us and leaders didn't react and people died. So it's hope that when we learn uh, Tanakh and, and Torah, we, we take an ethical um, understanding with us and you know, if, if we're going to consider maybe God is real, the implication is there's someone older than, than the universe who knows more than any, all, all wisdom put together. And if we ignore him, we can only find tragedy sooner or later as a, as, as a human kind. And we have to emulate God, go in his ways. If, if God was a human, he would have done something about it. And if he knew about it, and of course God knows about it. So what did God do? He sent people, uh, even a political leader there, and it was still ignored. And um, it's, it's just hard to imagine uh, that situation, but um, the important lesson here is that there has to be accountability. And I saw, I saw um, reaction to this. Some people were slandering uh, Haredim, the people who went to have a religious uh, event. Instead of saying, what were the police doing? Why have our politicians not reacted for three years to, to the warnings? And you know, if, if Torah and ethics are two separate things, you're not learning the Torah of God. And if your ethics lead to the death of other people, you're also not learning the Torah of God. God said in chapter 30 of, of Deuteronomy, Bechart Bechaim, choose life. That's God's agenda. He wants us to live and make the right decisions that help others to live as well. Live and be well. That's God's goal. And what happened here was a failure uh, in, in several commandments, not just one. And most importantly, there was a negligence in the face of human uh, risk and danger. And of course, the fall guy at the end of it is the, the Haredim, the religious uh, people and uh, therefore religion, and therefore, in, in a sense, uh, also, it, it's an assault on, on God's honor as well. But God warned us, and we didn't listen. So just however little or small you do in religion, it should be, it should be real for you. As it says in the Gemara Brachos, whether a person increases or, or has a small amount of, of prayer, in this case, and any kind of mitzvah we're doing. The main thing is that they should place their hearts of, upon heaven. We can't allow ourselves to to not have ethics and not allow the Torah to increase our ethics. The only way to do that is to create a division of, of, of uh, synagogue and state in our minds and only recognize God if we fail and we need someone to blame, but never recognize God when it's time for us to listen. 
And had we listened, no one would have died, not once. Okay, chapter 22 in Isaiah. Okay, so on the end on the end of page 160, the last word is the in the Hebrew is the first word of chapter 22. Uh, any questions before we begin? Any uh, follow-ups about last week? Okay, continuing. Masa gay chizalyum. Malache fo kialis kulach lagago lagagos. Teshuos Malaya Ir Homia, Kirya Aliza, Halalaich, Lo Halale Herev, Lo Me Se Milchama, Kol Ketzinaich, Nadu Yachad Mikeshes As Usaru, Kol Nim Tsaich, Usru Yachdav, Merachok Barachu, Alkin Amarti Shu. Mini am a rare a bechi alta itsu anachameni al shod basami ki yom mahuma o mavusa mavucha ladenoi elohim tsavos the gay chizayon the karkar kir vashoa el hahar the elam nasashpa the rechev adam baparashim the kir e ra magin ahimi pharm amakayich. Malu Rachev Haparashim Shos Shasu Hashara Vaigal Eis Nosach Yehuda Batabet Biom Hahu Al Nashek Eis Hayar Okay, let's pause here. The first eight verses in chapter 22. Can we have a volunteer translator? One through eight in chapter 22. A prophecy concerning the Valley of Vision. What happened to you now that you have all done up to the roots? You who had been full of commotion and tumultuous city, an exuberant town, you slain or not slain by the sword, nor did they die in war. All of your officers wandered off together, but were confined by the bow. All those who found within you were confined together, as well as those who had fled from afar. Now, I, I just want to know, uh, Russell, if I may, I, I just want to know, it's, even, uh, even a small class like this, God has uh, arranged our, our, our agenda according to the reality that we see around us. Uh, dis, we were discussing the other nations in, in the narrative here in Isaiah. Now we're going back to Israel. And in the discussion of Israel, and this week, right after this tragedy that happened on Lug Volmer, uh, now we're discussing about um, how officers wandered off and, and uh, people died, even, even though they were not slain by the sword. It's, it's just fascinating how this, uh, it, how God is, is, uh, is giving individual 
treatment to everyone, including us here in this class. Yeah. Our, our very verses are, are appropriate to a historic event that happened this past week in the very next class that we're having. It's Absolutely. Just interesting to know. Yeah, it's it's uh it's 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 the the Torah is all interconnected and and you can see this every time uh, you go in to study it. It is something that is is current and evolving within yourself. Well, yeah, I, now I know that I know that if a rabbi with Ruch Hakodesh, uh, you know, practically a prophet two thousand years ago, set up, you know, including uh, we're talking some of these uh, customs are from Moses or Ezra, actual prophets. If they set up a order of learning Torah and it has profound meaning in that time of the year, it's one thing. But we have, a, from an uh, outside perspective, we have a random class. Uh, we've had random delays on certain weeks. And then suddenly this chapter pops up exactly Same in the class following that tragedy. I, I, yeah. You know, that, that's a, that's, that's, it's not a coincidence, and it was not set up by any human with, with spiritually. This is a, like a direct setup from God that we came to this chapter at this time. And mm -hmm. I find that amazing as mm -hmm. well. Uh, please continue. Okay. Four. Chapter four. I said, therefore, leave me alone. I will weep bitterly. Do not insist on confronting me for the calamity of my people. For it is a day of breaking and, and trampling and uh, confusion unto my Lord, Hashem Elohim, Master of Legions, in the Valley of Vision of breaching the wall of crying out upon the mountain. Break, breaking trampling and confusion. Mm -hmm. Please continue. Oh, yeah. Please continue. Alam has taken up its quiver with chariots of men and horsemen and to, and to the wall they attached their shields. The choices of your valleys became filled with chariots and horsemen positioned themselves at the gate. He uncovered the shelter of Judah, but on that day, you look to the armaments in the house of the forest. Okay, and we're pausing here. It, we, we just, the whole tragedy was because everyone was stuck in a single gate uh, in Maron. Maron is uh, a sister um, town to uh, Tzafas, Seyfed. In Hebrew, house of the forest is base hayoar. And this is related to the phrase that refers to the house of Seyfed. It's, it's, it's just one. one <laughs> if, this, if this is coincidence, it's one coincidence after another after another. But it, obviously, it's not a coincidence. I, I'm just fascinating that, fascinated. Uh, that God is directing our class even towards his spiritual agenda. It's, you know, we're just playing a, a small, a small role in us, in us, whatever we're, Hashem decides for us. But I, I this is profound, and to, you know, from, from my perspective. It's incredibly profound as you read this and then think about the events that we've been following. It's uh, it's incredible. And the fact that, like you said, even though we stopped, we should have done chapter 22 last week and we didn't. So it's it's uh, it's just incredible. Uh, the hand of a shim and how it's it, it, it can be seen anywhere for those who look. Yeah, and and, and again, it's. Um... <clears throat> It's one thing if, if God sets the entire nation of Israel to have a, a order of, of reading the Torah, but to give um, to cater to even a small group of students of His Torah. Look how Hashem loves everyone who 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 deigns to give attention to His holy word. Mm 
it's, it's so beautiful. And and God promises to have mercy on the Yerish Hashem, and those who, who consider to think of his name. So God puts those who think of God's name on the level of those who fear him, even if they're sinners. So if we have an, a, a member of this class who, who feels that they are a sinner, the fact that you're thinking about God, God has delivered this direct message to you that most people in the world never, maybe have, maybe have never read this chapter. Even most religious people have maybe never read this chapter, and God is delivering this message to you in this audience today, um, or whenever you, you, if you see this as a video, uh, directly, uh, with the understanding that this happened, this class is happening just less than a week uh, after the the events at uh, Lagba Omer and Maron. I keep having a question pop up in my mind. All the Jewish people there, why didn't they stop um, trampling each other and go around the bodies on the ground and not knock them down? Well, from what I uh, heard, there was a bleacher on top of the exit, and the exit had like an open roof so that the bleacher collapsed one level at a time until you had four stories of bleacher and people who were on the bleachers on top of each other mixed in with, with, with wood and uh, metal framing all, all squished together. So it was a, a, real, a real mess. Once it happened, there, there was nothing to be done. It, it, was not, it wasn't really a stampede. It was, as far as the death toll, it was the uh, collapse of the, the, stru the, the structure, physical structure. Um, so th there wasn't apparently a lot of people uh, who died in the stampede. It was, it was from the falling of the bleachers, according to one news report that I read. But, and also uh, a lot of the people who, who were injured or died uh, were young teenagers. And, you know, some, some teenagers may not be, uh, you know, thinking about let me rescue someone and they may be just trying to you know escape um but there was a very touching story in in um i think i saw it in israel national news uh, that's our sheva in in um in english that uh there was uh, a uh, hasidic rabbi's son was trapped with with another boy and he was helping the boy to say Shema Yisrael because it looked like he was going to die. And the, the Rebbe's son finished Shema Yisrael, but the other boy died before he could finish his Shema Yisrael. So it's very, very sad. So um, that's, that's at least one story of a teenager who uh, <clears throat> had the presence of mind to try to calm someone uh, when he was facing his death. It's, it's an, an amazing thing. But when a death occurs because of a negligence, so that's something has to be done. And the, the government is so concerned about the next election and the next election being effective, I'm not sure they're doing an investigation yet. Whether the investigation happens um, in the current government or the next government or the next government after that, it eventually has to happen. And they have to figure out you need more than one to exit when you're having thousands of people in, in a building, uh, even if it's pretty wide, that, that obviously wasn't enough. And they received warning about it and they ignored it. Why? All, all, yeah, all of those codes and stuff exist, Rabbi. They exist everywhere. That's pretty common. It, it has to be ignored to get away with it because yeah. You know, I deal with I deal with fire codes and fire exits all and and all of that all the time, and you you can't have an assembly group and not have an, a, 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 the correct amount of exits and uh, that's just well known. Yeah, the, the codes are there because since most people are not experts, you don't want to have to roll the dice with someone's lives uh, when you invite someone over. 
the, the the codes are there because you want to be able to trust I'm presenting a, a safe uh, alternative to everyone and a uh, safe venue or a safe event, you know? Uh, and um, something wasn't done, but but the, the, the most disturbing thing to me was that the deputy mayor of Jerusalem was, was caught, crying out to, to some police there and they were ignoring him, maybe because he was from a, a co competing city or something. I don't know. It's just, a, a, so, I don't know what's going on there. But there were some police who, who were, um, who may need a, a little uh, correction in, in a legal sense. <laughs> okay, so uh, did you finish? Yeah, you finished through verse um, eight. Okay, let's continue in the Hebrew in verse nine. Base Baki a ear David or Isam, Hirabu Vatakabzu as me Habarecha Hatachtona, as Bate Yerushalayim, Sephartam Batis Zu Abatim Labat Ser Hahoma, Omikva Asisam Bain Hachomosayim, the me Habarecha Hayashana, Lo Hibat Tem El Oseha. Yotzra Merachok Lower Isam. They cried and I the him throws by Mahu, Divhi Lumi Spade, Lakorha Lachagor, Sak, Behine Sason Simcha Harog, Bak Karvashot Zon, Ahova Sarvasha So Sion, Ahova Shaso, Kimachar Namus, Nigla Vaznea Nuts Ros in Yehupar Her Avon, Azelachem. Artemusun Amar Adonai Okay, can we have a translator? Uh, through verse 14. Uh, 9 through 14. I can. You all, you saw that the breaches of the city of David were numerous. So you collected the waters of the lower pool. You counted the houses of Jerusalem and you demolished the houses to reinforce the wall. You made a moat between the two walls with the water of the old pool, but you did not look toward the one who made this happen and you did not consider the one who formed it long ago. My Lord Hashem Elohim, Master of Legions, declared that day to be the for crying and eulogy, for baldness and for the donning of sackcloth. Yet behold, there is joy and gladness, slaying of cattle and slaughtering the sheep, slaughtering of sheep, eating meat and drinking wine, saying, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This became revealed in my ears Hashem, Master of Legions, that this sin will never be atoned for you until you die, said my Lord Hashem Elohim, Master of Legions. So now the, this um, this phrase was repeated uh, in Roman times, uh, but with the, uh, the, the with the with the word for merriment. So eat, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That this is a paraphrase of of this uh, this uh, classic chapter in Isaiah. Uh, but um, if a person <clears throat> only looks at the counting of the Omer time as a buildup for the big party on Lag of Omer, so they're missing the spirituality of that time. That, that time is also a time of mourning the loss of Rabbi Akiva students. Over 20,000 uh, students of Torah passed away um, from a plague. And um, it's been a mourning a period for the Jewish people um, throughout history. According to some, that, that mourning ends on Lagba Omer. According to others, the mourning period ends only uh, right before Shavuos begins the, 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 um, the Pentecost holiday. Uh, so- Is it really supposed to be called Pentecost? 
in Judaism? Because I always thought that um, that Shavuos was the Jewish one and some other people want to call it something else that's not in our Torah. Well, that's, it's just, a, a, it's a, almost a secular name for it. It's, I'm not saying it out of, uh, it's not a religious alternative. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, like th there's there's no Gemara that uses the word Leviticus, yet we use it to describe Sefer of Aikra. Um, so, but the idea is that if a person um, only viewed the, the sphere of time, the counting of the Omer time, as uh, a massive party build, build up to, to have a big bonfire and get drunk or something that's not connected to uh, the, you know, the Jewish faith. So then th they would have been um, horribly mistaken. And um, this is also a time of introspection that we should not disrespect each other because you know, it's known that uh, if a person's a Torah scholar, they have an extra level of protection. God gives them extra angels to protect them from danger. But despite that, the over 20,000 students of Rabbi Kiva died, all within, uh, all within uh, uh, approximately a month, a month's time. So um, that, that's profound and we, we can't run away from the lessons of history. And again, in, in, this, in this reading here, Verse uh, verse twelve says, uh, "God declared that day to be for crying and eulogy. Yet behold, there is joy and gladness. Uh, eating meat and drinking wine is is the Talmudic example of of a person seeking the height of of joy. But they said, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Uh, a a Torah scholar doesn't who a Torah scholar who acts like a Torah scholar." doesn't pursue a path that will lead to death. Uh, the sages of the Talmud criticized the students of Rabbi Akiva that they were disrespectful to each, to each other, therefore they died. And then Rabbi Akiva, instead of having a giant uh, university for Talmud, he only had a, a, a small class with five students, including Rabbi Meir Balanes and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Rashbi, um, uh, who, the, who the bonfire ceremony was supposed to be about. Now, the, the, uh, if, if someone's celebrating the life of Rashbi, so the best way to do it is to learn Kabbalah, uh, learn you know, his, about his writings. But if a person just uses it for a party and to ignore all the the hard spiritual work that's necessary to become better people towards each other. So they, they, um, they're separating themselves from the spiritual opportunities. And if they're not Torah scholars and they have no intention to be Torah scholars, what they're doing is um, effectively turning their backs on Torah and, and risking themselves spiritually because when, when you hear a tragedy happens to Torah people, and I, again, I, I, I saw this discussion in social media in, in one page, they were blaming the victims, they were blaming the Haredim, then asked the question, how, how did all, all these people get stuck in a small area? You know, it, it, it's a zoning problem, but they were blaming the victims. And, and if we don't learn the lesson, that even supernaturally protected Torah scholars died during this time. Was it Jewish people blaming the victims or, or outsiders? Because that's kind of like a, somebody well, blaming a rape victim for being raped. No, it was apparently um, Jewish people who didn't respect Haredim uh, saying that the, those Haredim got to get it, get it together. Ugh. Stuff like that. Uh, so, again, uh, the, the, the reporter and the deputy mayor of Jerusalem are both paraded, and they were the, 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 uh, the uh, kind of like prophets God sent to 
to, to avoid this, this horrible tragedy and they were ignored. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to blame it on Haredim. But even the, if, if, if the Haredim who are, have more, spiritual, more spirituality, more spiritual pursuits, more Torah than the average person could have this tragedy, who, who's immune? And if the great students of Rabbi Akiva, uh, who had more Torah than, than almost any rabbi nowadays, uh, could, could die because they disrespected each other, who is immune if we don't have awe of heaven and love for each other? What, what, what is left to us if, if we separate ourselves from God's mercy? And who are we? What are we if we let our brothers into a place of danger and don't protect them just because they're them, they're Haredim, they're the people with blue hats, they're the people with yellow scarves, whatever it is. I, how could we have a, a bias against this group or that group, consequently treat them with less uh, dignity or, or respect or protection? Uh, is, is this, is the anti-Haredi uh, reaction, a reaction, or is it part of the problem that because it was only a Haredi event, a, a very religious, ultra-Orthodox religious event, therefore it didn't need to have inspectors. Oh, they re rely on God, let them rely on God for this, for, for, for safety here too. But that's not what the law is. Even going back to the Torah, it says one law you shall have, you shall have for the uh, Native and, and and the stranger, and uh, certainly that applies to a secular government and a, a democracy it's supposed to have a single law for everyone. Otherwise, it's a discrimination. So, you know, it's it's just it's it's hard to understand how this all happened. Except, again. God says that in this verse that he set it for a day of cry, crying and eulogy. And um, it echoes here, you know, as God says later in, in, in Isaiah, that God creates evil, but it doesn't say that he wields evil. People chose uh, to use the evil opportunity that was allowed by heaven to be negligent towards their brethren. Okay, uh, another interesting thing to note from a grammatical uh, perspective, uh, the the paragraph in the Hebrew ends on the on the phrase on the phrase um, Hashem Elohim, Master of Legions, uh, but that's at the end of verse fourteen. In the English, the the paragraph ends at the end of verse thirteen, which is Eat and drink it, for tomorrow we die. <laughs> so, uh, apparently. <laughs> Whoever was uh, uh, setting up the chapters for, for uh, King James uh, was fascinated by this verse about eating and drinking. <laughs> and uh, I decided that's a good place to pause the paragraph. But if you look at the actual Hebrew paragraph, it ends with, my Lord Hashem Elohim, Master of Legions. Oh, but if you mention that, now you got to serve God and stuff instead of just thinking about eating, drinking, and, and then slaying people until they die. <laughs> okay, you know, so... Yeah, I I don't know. I guess those nights of the round table times were a little bit different than nowadays. I guess. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to continue uh, verse uh, 15 in the Hebrew. Any questions first? Okay, before we do, just um, to, to quote Radak and Rashi on verse 13, let's, let's look. This is page 167, the third paragraph uh, of the left column in, in the um, Art Scroll Molstein edition. <clears throat> Yet behold, there is joy and gladness, slaying of cattle and slaughtering of sheep. Although God had sent his prophet to rebuke the people and urge them to repent, they did not heed the warning and some blatantly defied God's words. 
Instead of trembling at the rebuke, they mocked the prophets and banded together in a public display, display of merriment and friv frivolity. Radak, God, so to speak, was mourning, and his people were eating and rejoicing. Rashi. This, this comment also is extremely powerful, talking about what, what the events in uh, Maron on Lag Omer. God sent warnings, but they didn't, they didn't listen. And God was already in mourning for the evil that was about to occur. It makes me wonder how, how those people that were there and experienced this, that lived through it, feel if they read it before it happened and, or now, like we're reading this, I wonder what they think about it or feel. Do you happen to know anyone? No, I don't, but I think it's important to, to understand that uh, this is, this is uh, similar to a, a discussion uh, I had with someone um, around, uh, around 1980 or 82, around there, discuss, discussing the, the, the Holocaust. Uh, God knew what was going to happen. Why did God mm -hmm. let it happen? Right. God gives free will, and God gives a structure of salvation and ways to save it. And you know what happened with the uh, deputy Sorry, mayor? Uh, oh, uh, just a second. You know what happened with the deputy mayor of Jerusalem who was in attendance at the event? Uh, he essentially said, I'm out of here. <laughs> he, he, was scold, he scolded the police when they ignored him. He said, that's it. You know, he, he's, he's, he's getting out of there. Uh, Can I show uh, a book or you want to flip the screen? Okay. Uh, all right. So now we have Rabbi uh, Rabbi Hill. One of, you, one of your students. Okay. Rabbi Hill is here. So uh, uh, he wants to discuss. I a, want to interject. Interject. A, a, um, a quote from a Rishon uh, uh, about uh, the, uh, the author of the Chavos Halavavos. On the topic that you're discussing. On the topic that we're discussing. This is also ch chapter 22 in Isaiah. And right. God made it that this, this chapter is the chapter we're reading right after the events in Maron. And it is several verses are appropriate for the, this uh, discussion. Wow. So can I raise the book? Please? Yeah, please come here. Oh, good. All right. So this book, Gate of Trust, Shar HaBetachan, it was written by almost a thousand years ago by a Jewish judge named in Hebrew Dayan from a Jewish court, who is also a very famous philosopher and recognized since then at the time by Jews and Gentiles, named Rabbeinu Bachia, also known as, known as Rabbeinu Bachaya. He wrote a book called Duties of the Heart because there were plenty of books. There were plenty of books codifying the laws of God in terms of what our body needs to do, but not many were organizing what one needs to believe and what kind of thoughts one needs to entertain and get rid of. Long story short, he makes it clear that while God gives us permission, God gives us free will, that only pertains to one's actions and intentions. It does not pertain to the outcome of our actions and intentions. So, um, when he, he makes it clear that no human being, Jew or Gentile, has the power to impact, for good or for bad, another without God allowing it. So, there's always a decision by God whether to allow the bad and or the good to happen, and or whether not to allow it. So... The question we ask about the Holocaust was worded correctly by, by Rabbi Vitalo, Rabbi Friedlander. He was saying that the question is, when the Nazis set out to do their evil, why did God allow it? But that is the correct nuance here. The fact that God allowed it means that even if the Nazis were not going to do it, there was a need for that type of pain and that type of um, situation 
to impact the Jewish people for wh whatever the reason is. There was supposed to be some type of birth pangs of redemption or any other way you want to, uh, it was foretold in the times of the Talmud that in the era leading up to the redemption, there'll be so much suffering that the rabbi said, if I have to be reincarnated in any future generation, let it be any other than the one right before the Messiah comes, Mashiach comes, the redemption arrives. And they were well aware that there will be pogroms throughout the generations, yet they preferred the other generations than the one in the last hundred years before Mashiach comes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. So the, the point here is that um, there is no contradiction between free will and God controlling outcomes because the outcomes God controls but what we try to do or not do, that is entirely our free choice. How successful we are about our efforts, that's God's choice. Okay, so that's the opinion of Rabbi Bachir Ibn Pakuda. There are two uh, Rabbi Bachirs. Uh, this is the older, the, the one who lived longer time ago, almost a thousand years ago. Um, so now, there's an added compl complexity that in addition to, and, and this is borne out in uh, in the Gemara and Kedushi in the end of chapter one, uh, the end of chapter one. Okay. That people have, excuse me. Could you remove that? Could you move that pole? Yeah, that's that became uh, spoiled. The one I want to get her. Don't assume that mean bevesecha. Don't allow blood in your your household. If you know something became uh, damaged uh, and it's a food, don't let someone else eat from it. Okay. All right. So. I'm eager to know if you have a different different opinion in Judaism and the sages. Yes, well, because what the uh, Gemara tradition says that imagine yourself that uh, the world is 50-50 and your one deed is going to be the, the deed that changes the balance of the scale. That's not possible if you already believe that God has uh, made a, a fate. That's referring to uh, the arrival of Mashiach? No, that that all is faded and we just have a choice of how we react to stuff. We don't actually affect a change in the universe. So the short answer is we do affect immediate changes, but God adjusts. So let's say I gave someone a hundred dollars, but God does not feel that they, that person deserves it. So within a very short period of time of me giving it to them, God is going to slip it out of that amount of money out of their back pocket in the form of, you know, a scratch on the car, a medical bill, a ticket, will do something to adjust and neutralize that which the person wasn't supposed to get. So it doesn't mean that technically we don't have an immediate illusion of an impact, but the degree to which we'll be successful in harming the other person, that got to neutralize. So let's say someone was not meant to die. So either God will prevent them from actually dying or God will give them so much reward for the fact that their life was suddenly cut short, he'll reset them in a much more beautiful family for their next reincarnation. One, that the soul themselves would testify, I prefer this outcome of events than having stayed alive in my situation. So the point is not very technical about the outcome. The point is that we can't meaningfully harm or do good for others in a way that does not already have God's signature in terms of the totality. So... The total amount of income, the total amount of usable income the person will have, the total amount of joy or pain another person will have cannot be impacted by another, even though the immediate distribution might be affected, but it jiggles back to the way it's supposed to be. But in the context of the national scene, um, can we affect the world? Can we make the world a better place? Can we make the world a more dangerous place? Uh, so what happens is people make choices, ethical, 
choices that have spiritual ramifications. And more and more people make more and more choices, more and more people in uh, key positions make more and more choices. And when the balance scale is towards demerit, uh, that's when tragedies occur. I have a question about that. Upon, uh, at the end of chapter one in Kedushin in, in the Babylonian Talmud. Yes. All right. So since I don't know how to word it, like uh, my question is: is everything like is everything that is good and everything that is bad already planned out and like what he was just reading um, to balance the scales if he if somebody gets the money that they shouldn't get and then like their car gets scratched or something uh, could it also be that it's just a matter of what is reversed and what's not because the same thing could happen in reverse where um, somebody could scratch their car and then they get the money to pay for it so correct exactly correct that means that's on the note of harm nobody could cause you harm that was not signed off by god if it seemed that you go that someone harmed you if that harm was not already meant for your benefit to cleanse you or to test you to give you more reward by how graciously and faithfully you responded to it there are many reasons why something might appear to harm you but if you respond appropriately to it then if it wasn't supposed to happen and you responded appropriately, you actually get reward for the way you graciously responded and thank God for it, trusting him that he'll handle it in the best way for you and that's for your good. If it was meant to happen to you because of some type of prior mistake or cleansing that you needed, that your soul needed through the aggravation that cleanses, then again, that person, if they didn't uh, scratch the card, then there would have been some other type of, uh, you know, you would have stubbed your toe or done something else that would have affected the same amount of aggravation and cleansing that was destined. So the total amount of aggravation that someone will experience or lack thereof is, is set actually by God. That parameter is set by God. How it actually plays out, that's where human beings get free choice, whether to be the bad messenger or not to be the bad messenger. But the total amount of aggravation you'll receive is decided by God and is never influenceable by anyone other than God. Now, on, on a positive note, um, if a person is supposed to get a certain amount of aggravation, they can actually um, get time served. They can actually get less than what's actually required if they immediately respond to it with thanking God and acknowledging that it's really God that's behind it. So instead of getting angry at the perpetrator, at the hoodlum, or at the, you know, the evil person, you've got to do what you've got to do in terms of actions. You've got to call the police if someone you know, is messing. But in terms of the anger, if you attribute and you recognize and you smile to God and say, thank you, God, for washing me. Thank you, God, for cleansing me. Thank you, God, for changing my diaper as a child. You know, might not understand it, but you understand that God is doing this for your good, like a loving mother or father. So when you respond with a smile and with and 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 thanking God for the tough love, then that could short circuit the amount of pain you're supposed to experience because the pain was only there because you forgot about God's presence. And by immediately acknowledging God's presence, you're accomplishing the inner intent that caused the need for cleansing in the first place. So it's a way to short cut the circuit is simply turning back to God more intensely. And that undoes the mistake that led to the need for the cleansing. And that's at the micro le level. At the macro level, uh, from the worldwide perspective, I'll give a parable that, uh, so God essentially set, is, is like a, someone who sets up a theater and a improv uh, play. And he sets up the scenery, he builds the scenery, he, he sets up the audience, he sets up uh, the, the basic plot that they, the actors have to uh, run through but it's an improv, the, the complete improvisation, they have to come up with it. And their goal is to, is to make sure the audience laughs at least 20 times. And until the audience laughs 20 times, uh, nobody's going home tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, we got one. Right, so uh, now 
uh, if if people work together, and and they act with inspiration towards uh, not just their personal goals, but for the sake of of heavenly goals, so then they they can be inspired to do funny things, whether it's a, a word play or slapstick, whatever the case may be. I mean, it's terrible. And then eventually people are going to laugh 20 times in that night. Or they can kind of slack off and do their own personal thing just to upstage one another. And then kind of say, uh, one of them says, no, but I feel like a drama, not, not a comedy. And, and one person says, no, I feel like a tragedy, not a drama. And, and so it actually takes them about 5,700 years uh, before they get the, the, the 19th laugh. And now they just need one more laugh and then Mashiach will come. Okay, so that's, that's a parable for, for the world and, and free will before God. I want to mention one thing about faded. You asked a good question about faded. Are things faded in a way that can't be changed? So God says in a parsha called Bichukotai, right? Is that how you pronounce it? Bichukotai. Bichukotai. Le the last uh, portion of Leviticus. God says very clearly that things are not fixed. The outcomes to your choices are faded, but which choices you will choose can change the outcomes I've preset in motion. So it's an algorithm. So if I choose the right choices, then I will have life and blessings, God says then those will be the outcomes you uh, I've predetermined for that track of choices. And if you choose to go against my will, then you're choosing outcomes that are curses. So which outcomes will actually manifest, although God is the one that decided the outcomes, but he only decided them as potential outcomes. Which one you will actualize, God allows you to choose. Yes, and, and that reminds me of, the, we had a class discussing God's wrath, God's anger. Uh, so God's anger, are, to, from our perspective, is effectively a pre-programmed response. Because when God has an emotion, it doesn't control him like he controls us. And in fact, the, there's a, a mimer that says God can have anger and a rational art, uh, discussion at the exact same time. And it happened with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was arguing for, for mercy for B'nai Israel. At the very moment, God was completely outraged about about the uh, the golden calf, and it wasn't just the golden calf. They killed Chor. Chor was the Mashiach of his generation. He, he was uh, extremely holy, and uh, they killed him because he said, "Let's serve God." Uh, so that the, because it became a a a, uh, a bloodshed uh, event, uh, therefore it was the uh, it was an adultery out of control, and uh, it was became. A great source of wrath, but God's wrath is not human wrath. It's, it's a um, pre-programmed response from our perspective. It's a intellectual process. If I don't show tough love, they will continue along this path. You know, so it's not it's not the same thing as a, a human who completely loses. It. God never loses. It. Uh, Rabbi, can can I offer um, uh, a position and have have you discuss it? And can can I in what you're talking about? Um, oh, sure. uh, Russell brought up a few minutes ago about the um, uh, certain codes in place, and and uh, you know they're put there to protect us. And then also uh, this phrase that you used that you you didn't use it but you spoke it uh, and read it eat drink for tomorrow we die uh, dealing also with uh, codes and building and thing I find that people sometimes become relaxed of the codes because they think they are too strenuous for me nothing's going to happen to me on my watch and then therefore the builders get relaxed well they don't want it so I'm not going to mess with it and so they get this mindset you know what i'm going to eat and drink i'm not afraid of death today i'm not going to worry about death today i'm going to eat and drink we'll worry about dying tomorrow it, would that be a, a way to look at this or am i stretching it a little bit right if, if it was only that if it, was, if it was only that so then it's it's a way of dealing with risk um and it, it would be more excusable but in this case uh the police were warned by uh, a reporter over two years ago, 
and by by a, a leading politician in Israel on the very same night, and they didn't do any changes. Uh, so in this case, it's eat, drink, and be merry because the guy sitting over there, he's about to die, uh, which is sounds like cruelty, not like uh, you're trying to evade your, your fears. Evading fears could potentially be a good thing because then you could react. Like if someone knows they're, they're in a, uh, a towering inferno and they have to figure a way, how do they get off of this floor safely? So you know, maybe a, a little drink at that point may not be the worst for if they, if they don't have a spirituality, maybe they could use a, a belt of, of a hard drink, uh, could, could uh, concentrate better on, on a path to, to possibly surviving. Maybe they could uh, uh, remember, uh, you know, uh, you could use a fire hose to, to slide down to the next floor or something, who knows, whatever the case may be. Um, and, uh, but, but for uh, when, when it's at someone else's risk and when so you happen to be a, a policeman charged with the public safety of others, and then the biggest thing on your mind is which restaurant you're gonna to go to after this is all done. <laughs> Is there a chance that everyone who was re ignoring that, maybe deep in their hearts, that's exactly what they wanted to happen is for everyone to die and that's why they didn't do anything. And, and the Gemara teaches us in, in Kisubos 30 that from a, if you're passive in the, in the face of negligence, it, it, it's a choice. And when enough people do it, it's a choice for destruction. So when, a majority of people say uh, to themselves that now is the time for destruction and God gave free will. I mean, what is God supposed to do? If he removes free will, then people say, oh, you didn't let me have free will, you know? So, um, but the, the conception of the end of days is, is precisely that. God guarantees that no matter how bad we, we make this world, <laughs> Uh, there will be an end of days when people can get away with evil. Not an end of days where, of, of, of days, not an end of days of world civilization, an end of days where evil may reign. The world's going to be a wonderful place. Uh, if the world was meant to be uh, utter destruction, what's all that talk about a lamb and a wolf sitting to, uh, lying together? What, with a uh, mushroom cloud in the background? No, 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 it doesn't make sense. So the world is supposed to live and be well. but what's going to happen is if people haven't repented by the end of days time, uh, God will force them to accept Mashiach in the concept of that a world where we have to actually serve God, where his, his will means something. <clears throat> Remember the Jewish conception of Mashiach uh, is that God comes first. Uh, said this a couple times before. In the, uh, we say it every day. And on Chavez, we actually say it twice a day. But in the Ezra Israel uh, uh, prayer, <clears throat> right after Shema Israel, before Shema Nasri, the Amida prayer. Uh, we say, This is uh, Ashkenaz, Svard, and, and uh, also Chabad. They all say this. Uh, in truth, uh, you are the first and you are the last. And other than you, we have no king, redeemer, and savior. So God is our king, redeemer, and savior. Mashiach is our, our leader to help, help us make sure that we keep God in mind as our king, a uh, leader, uh, redeemer, and savior. Uh, but he's not a substitute for God. He's, he's just a uh, facilitator. So when Mashiach comes, it, the whole world will be better. <clears throat> the only question is from a world perspective, global perspective, will people choose to be better or will God just bring the end of days? There's one rabbi who said that um, uh, recently there was a rabbi who said that uh, there's no choice that uh, there will have to be 
uh, a uh, forced end of days, uh, considering how close it is to the end time. But you know, that's, that's one perspective. Uh, anything could happen. So might as well not worry about that. Just make our, make sure we make the right choices and, and make sure we encourage others to make the right choices. If uh, everyone's making right choices, it's impossible for these tragedies to occur. God said, choose life. If we all desire life and life for those of our friends and, and acquaintances and the strangers we meet, we hope they live too. How is it possible for there to be tragedy? Because God, God said, let there be life, you know, cho cho choose life. So therefore, it, even one death in the world is an indication someone wanted it, either actively or passively. That's why there's death in the world, because people want it, and some people demand it. Some people demand death. I want, I want to just and you, you you visit some countries and and mention you're an American. They could say uh, death to America on, on your behalf. <laughs> it's a greeting in some countries. Sorry, there was a, there was a flight in South Africa that um, unfortunately um, fell out of the sky, and they had I think um, I don't know seventy two people or you know almost a hundred souls were lost. And I remember one sagely rabbi explaining that it was not that there were a few people that were meant to die and others got caught up and swept up in that, but God used his infinite intelligence to gather together all and coordinate all of these souls who had to die at that time and at that place and made extensive arrangements to bring them all to have a pretext to be on the same plane at that time. Who died and who got hurt and who didn't get hurt at all at this event, one can reasonably argue God is intelligent and capable and sophisticated enough with his creation to coordinate and organize and move things around so that it seems to have been triggered by human beings' willful negligence. And it may very well have. But who dies and who lives and who just gets hurt, that's still God decides. Right. But uh, what I'm saying is beyond that. What I'm saying is that even though it's God, uh, God orchestrates it. Because they were negligent the year before and the year before right. too. Even though God orchestrates it, the implication of, of the philosophy of the, and the first chapter of Kedushin is that... Um, one person can change the world from evil to good. It's a visual and God message. says, choose life. And wait, wait, if so, what, what if that happened? What if it, there was actually exactly 50% good, 50% evil, and there was one individual who uh, maybe uh, you know, spends more time uh, playing than, than, than learning, whatever the case may be, but he decides, okay, you know, I'll just do one more mitzvah, why not? And then he, the whole world's saved, okay? So that person chose life, in, in a sense. It's, it's beautiful, but I think the obligation, I, by the way, this is a classical Talmudic uh, style debate that's happening right now, because I'm going to argue that if you look at the Talmud, it is not telling us a question of fact, it's simply stating a question of mindset. So even though we can't really impact others negatively, but <laughs> God expects us to view ourselves as if the world is in balance and the entire of the world depends well, on our next decision. The, the, that, the percentage of how much it's in balance, that, that of course we have to assume. However, <clears throat> choose life is a rational choice. Right, but it's not referring if, to if, other- If it has no meaning, so it's not a choice. No, your, your choice is always up to you. The outcome is not correct. Correct, but we've learned earlier today, tonight. Yeah, if enough people get together and choose evil or good, you yeah. know, the result will be evil or good. Gotcha. Where, Free will. Can you give me the exact quote where it says that that there is some type of tipping point? Well, that's the implication of a condition. Okay. Could you? So it says. So what's what's the actual wording? I just want to register because it's news to me. Okay, uh, so so if um, uh, if the world is fifty percent uh, uh, good and evil, and you do one more mitzvah, the the world will tip into so the Rambam. I don't know from the Talmud, but Rambam says that one is obligated 
to think of their actions as, as, as consequential and as effective as if the world is like a scale, to, uh, balanced scale. Yeah, that's a paraphrase of Ekamar. Yeah, and that with one good deed, he could not just rectify himself, what is it called, tip the scales to his own personal benefit, but he could bring uh, Geula, redemption, <coughs> redemption for the world. Yes, and there's even a, um, <coughs> Uh, a medrash that describes that Mashiach will, will do an extra act of righteousness to help bring Mashiach sooner. The Rebbe actually says that you never know when it's actually sca the scales are actually balanced and which mitzvah will be the one to tip the scale. So every single mitzvah, whenever you have an opportunity to do a good deed, immediately grab it because you might be that lucky one that adds that that piece of straw that broke the uh, exiles camels back. <laughs> well, Rabbi, isn't that, isn't that the same concept we're talking about is to have more adversaries than advocates? You know, if we're looking at it in the in the in the micro on an individual, but then on a global, uh, isn't that the, the same concept is to create more good than you do evil? And, and then the world uh, replicates the same thing. Like, exactly. Right, exactly, and then that's uh, that's the Gemara of Kedushin forty uh, B, precisely that. So, it, it's uh, fascinating, <laughs> fascinating stuff. Thing, yeah. Rabbi. Yes. Can I uh, sure. say something? Um, I'm trying to understand this. So, this tragedy that happened was not the people's fault. Everyone's there. It was. It was neglected by somebody else, but they had to die because of somebody else's neglect. So well, that's so one or two questions. That's one question. Yeah, right. Is that is that right? And the other question is: so if those that died, if they might have made a mitzvah before they even went, that there could have been a possibility that they might not have perished. Okay, so very great, great question, great double question. So could you take apart each premise before you yeah. respond? Well, premise number one, were they otherwise not going to die if someone else didn't do something negative? That's question number one. Someone was going to die. It didn't have to be them. But it wasn't their fault. Correct. Because they went. Is that correct? Correct. Now the question is, we cannot fully answer why God chose them. We would have to know God's will to know why God chose them. For example, if what if it was from a, 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 a amount of merit, they or or the a person in the other city, either that person or that person, person A or person B, could die in that in that spot on that night. Okay, so why was this one chosen? Was this one chosen because? Uh, he did not have as many merits that night, or was this one chosen because he had more merits and he could achieve a greater change to the world if he died? Mm -hmm. Is this tragedy that's more beautiful. profound? You're flipping the yes, right that's... Who says dying at that holy place at that holy time was a punishment for those who died? Right. If anything, <clears throat> if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, they probably were embraced by one of the holiest sages right after they died. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was probably the one to sort of greet them. And chances are that the amount of joy yes. and the amount of ecstasy they experienced at this moment was, um, they will tell you, they will testify, is worth much more than anything going good for them on earth. The real yes. victims, I think, are those who, who stayed alive and, and, mm -hmm. and, and experienced the trauma without the delight. I mean, th those mm -hmm. are the ones who are really being tested. Well, even that, if someone witnesses a trauma that could have been prevented, now you have advocates to avoid negligence in the future. You have a whole stadium of people who don't want negligence to occur anymore. They've had it up to here. It's, 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 it's over. I have no doubt that there are tens of thousands of engineers around the world responsible for different stadiums and different uh, venues that have taken some active, you know, thoughtful measures right now asking, is there any, you know, loose screw on my responsibility, on my uh, 
Is there somewhere where I cut corners, which might come back to haunt me? I've no doubt that this created, saved a lot of lives on the yes. global scale, immeasurably. That's and, true. Yeah, even 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 yes. inspectors and and building construction guys yes. and even the worker making the welds on the on the on the structures, you know you know when this, when something like this happens, it catches a lot of attention and 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 the whole world is a little bit better, you know because the uh, people are conscious of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and <clears throat> now spiritually speaking, Moshe Rabbeinu uses the same arguments uh, to describe his nephews. Another of a passing away and, and comforting his brother Aaron, uh, that um, uh, they were on a higher level than us. That's why God chose them to die. So th this is uh, this is a, a sort of concept. It's you know, and um, uh, but on a possible factor, uh, a supposition of mine. Uh, why would you only have one? even though it was extremely uh, large, why would you have only one access point um, in, in a um, ancient city uh, for mm -hmm. the people to, to travel in? It's because it's an ancient city. So now there, it wasn't just a lack of city planning. It was the, the a, like the, the evil inclination of, of, of civilization builders is that if it's old, you, you got to preserve it unless unless it's a, a, a Torah knowledge, and then they don't necessarily want to listen to it. But, uh, but if it's an old piece of uh, real estate, old, old building, so they revere it, they don't want to take out one stone. So we're talking about ancient buildings. From from Israel's perspective, it's not the oldest building, uh, any anywhere near the oldest build of structure. But from like an American perspective, it's like four times older than anything you could find in America. So like just if, if a, one of the city planners of, of uh, Maron uh, was having to be like someone from a, a Western civilization, uh, the, the, the structure there seemed older than anything they've ever seen, except maybe in Greece. So therefore they, they were hesitant probably to create a new opening in an in ancient uh, edifice. Uh, but people have to come first. If you're going to put living people there, then the living people come first. They should, have simply, they should have simply limited the people, the number of people that have access. Yes. Right. right. That, that's also something to do. Great shift. You're saying that they had an ancient, like a super ancient building, and they were the expecting theater. it to, um, to fit like the society of amount of people in the events that is happening today yeah i mean just think about any any stadium in anywhere in the world it could be a soccer stadium anything there's always more than one exit so i'm thinking the only reason plausible reason is for it to not have more than one exit is that people just revered the uh, thousand year old structure and and of the amphitheater and they did not want to break into it. But if you're going to have living people there from a Torah perspective, you have to make sure they get out alive as well. Oh. Okay. So, so can we just recap, because I wasn't at the oh. beginning, what are the main lessons you want us to take away from today's class? Uh, serve God and keep his commandments, because that's the sum of man. I, I got that in the last verse of uh, Ecclesiastes. Second, second from the last verse. All right. So, um, <clears throat> more? No, it's just this chapter had, so we pointed out, you could check out the recording of this, this uh, class later. So the verse had several uh, verses that uh, completely correspond to the uh, tragedy that happened. <laughs> Meaning in terms of warnings and, and Warn, the yeah. consequences. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now we left off at uh, verse 15. Let's continue in the Hebrew. I have a volunteer translator. Kumar Dunai Lohim Svos, Lachbo Al Hasochein Haze, Al Shechna Asher Al Habois. Malacha fo umilacha fo kicha tavta lacha fo cover hos vi marom kivro hokaki vasela mishkan low. Kinia naima tal talacha 
Kal Hila Gavir Botaha Arto Sonof Eats Nuff Eats Nuffa Tsenefa Kadur El Eretz Rahavas Yadoyim Shama Samus Vashama Markovos Kvodeha Kalon Bes Adonacha Bad Daf Ticha Im Matsavecha Mima Madha Yaher Secha Vaya Bayamahu Vakarasil Avdi Lel Yakim Ben Shilki Yahu. Okay, so can we have a translator? Verse 15 through 20. Thus saith my Lord, Hashem Elohim, Master of Legions, go and approach the treasurer, Shibna, who is in charge of the house. Tell him what you, <clears throat> what have you here and whom have you here, that you have been you yourself, a grave here. You who digs his graves on high and craves out in the <clears throat> rock in the abode for himself. Behold, Hashem will throw you around with great force and cause you to fly away. He will wind you around his turban and hurl you like a ball to a land without obstacles. There you will die and there your chariots of honor will suffer the disgrace that you wished upon your master's house. I will cast you out from your position and he will bring you down from your post. It shall be on that day that I will call upon my servant, upon Elikim's, Elikim of Hilkiah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, very good. All right, so let's uh, look at the commentary. Okay, so, so now we're going uh, back into the history. And it's fascinating. We're, we're talking about a history of something that has not happened yet. So it's, it's really fascinating. It's uh, talking mm -hmm. about the uh, miracles that will happen in Hezekiah's day. Mm -hmm. So let's look at verse at the commentary of uh, 15, page 167, second column, fourth paragraph, Shebna's treachery and punishment. Isaiah diverges from his prophecy about Jerusalem to speak about Shebna, a traitorous official in the court of Hezekiah. Uh, when Sennacherib, Sennacherib is Sennacherib. Uh, when he besieged Jerusalem, Shebna was one of those who was sure the city would fall. So, you know, since had laid to waste every country in his way. And he sought, so, Shebna sought, to ingratiate himself with the conquering Assyrians. Shebna wrote a note declaring that he and his party were willing to submit to the Assyrians, but Hezekiah and his party were not. Then he shot an arrow over the city walls to Sennacherib. Uh, Shebna hoped to be appointed governor of the holy city after it was conquered. Okay, now let's see what is the verse. I think it was 17. Was it 17? Um, Okay, so uh, what happened to him was that um, it turned out that all of his followers abandoned him and eventually he was killed by the Assyrians. Uh, Shebna. Okay. So um, mm -hmm. trying to betray uh, his king was not the best uh, long-term solution for his uh, political career. Um, okay, so let's look at verse 20, Eliakim. Uh, the commentary on page 171, second paragraph. It shall be on that day, verse 20, uh, when Shebna is ousted, God will influence Hezekiah to replace him with Eliakim. 
since God will cause Hezekiah to appoint Eliakim, it's considered as if God himself summoned Eliakim. Commentary of Radak. My servants, the hitherto unknown Eliakim was the rare distinction of being called God's servant, sharing this noble title with Moses, Caleb, King David, and other great people. We also find um, by, uh, by Cyrus the Great that God called him his servant before he took office. Whenever someone's going to come and change an administration from, from evil to good, they're called his servant. This explains why the, the, um, those kings who started a new, uh, a new dynasty among the northern kingdoms were anointed at all. If the northern kingdom was temporary, why anoint them at all? But they were going to destroy the previous uh, idolatrous kings. So therefore, the anointment meant God is sending them as, as his messenger. Uh, and it was trying to give an encouragement. So therefore, you be religious and I'll bless you. And of course, it didn't last too long. Once they, they uh, killed the evil, they just continued the evil uh, in their own version of it. Uh, but uh, thank God, in the southern kingdom, it continued uh, the, the service of God. Okay, continuing in verse 21 to the end of the chapter. Vil bashtiv kutan techa, vav netecha, achaz kenu, umem shaltecha, etein viado, vaya la'av uliyosh. we have a translator verse uh, 21 through through uh, 25. I will dress him with your tunic and gird him with your belt, and I will deliver your dominion into his hand. And he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. He will open and no one will close, and he will close and no one will open. I will affix him, affix him as a peg in a secure place, and he will be like a thorn, excuse me, a throne of the honor of his father's house. They will hang upon him the entire honor of his father house, father's house. And the sons and the daughters, every small article from various bowels, bowls, to all kinds of stringed instruments. On that day, the world of the word of Hashem, master of legions, the peg, of Shabin, Shabina, Shabna. Shabna, that is afflicted in a secure place, will move away, and the load that is upon it will be plucked off and fall and be destroyed, for Hashem has spoken. So Shebna uh, was the equivalent of a, a king's chamber, chamberlain, or in, in um, the uh, American equivalent, perhaps a chief of staff, of, of the uh, president. Uh, so he had such a, lo a lofty position and uh, he, he was uh, acting, uh, acting treacherous. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an ethical quandary um, if he feels that evil is about to befall uh, his, um, uh, his uh, king. 
uh, and what what will happen to the nation if there's no one to talk to the uh, to the uh, invaders, so the invaders can be more harsh to the people. So maybe he meant well, but you know the the path to the uh, the hot place is, is sometimes paved with, with good intentions. Um, but the the key ethical thing was that he benefited personally by his betrayal. So therefore, he had to ask a question. Whenever you have something that is good for you and is re really bad for someone else. It's good to, to get some advice on that, ethically speaking. He knew it was an utter betrayal of his king. So um, that, of course, is a, um, you know, is a uh, severe penalty. Any questions? So Rabbi, when we're, when we're looking at the book of Isaiah, you know, the events in it and what they're pertaining to and what they're associated with, is it safe to say that the entire book it can be understood or related to as past, present, and future? Or, you know, because I understand there are segments of the book that can be done like that, but would, we, would it be safe to say that the entire book could be looked at from that perspective as past, present, and future? Uh, more so than many other books. But um, there are some parts that are more fixed. They're only for certain times. So we do have, so we do have uh, fixed times within the book of Isaiah. Yes, but it's, it's, it's uh, few and far between because he's, he's usually speaking, his prophecies usually do not speak about a single time in history. He, for example, if he's talking about the destruction of, uh, of, of Jerusalem, he's talking about it in two different generations. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's complex to, to try to limit what he's saying. But topically speaking, if a topic is repeated in history, so then uh, it, it probably has a, a reference to that as well. Do you, do you think this, this event that, that we've been discussing tonight, is that something that's repeated in history? I mean, it's a significant, you know, the number 45, which is significant, and where it was was significant, and, and who it was was significant. You know, is there some kind of tie? Is there something within a, within a Gilgal process or something that this is a reoccurring type of situation that we're looking at? I mean, for it to even be in, in Isaiah, you know, like this. Um, Yechiel had an idea about a Zohar about this? There is a Zohar, the book that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is said to have authored, that speaks of 45 people dying on the day of Lagba Omer. However, oh, that, that references, it was a conversation between the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who, who passed, who, whose gravesite we're referring to, resting place we're referring to, in conversation with Elijah the prophet. However, the context, if you study it carefully, it certainly is not referring to this time. At best, it's an illusion. It's I don't know how to say that in, in, in English, but how do you say a, a, a hint? Uh, a hint. It may be a hint of, of, of something in the future because of the number and the date, the number of deaths and the date. But the context there was 45 bad people, 45 evildoers who are coming after um, who are chasing or pursuing um, one of them, either Elijah or Rabbi Shimon Yechai. So if you want to see more about it, you Google it, and there's a very heated debate between, you could just Google the words Zohar reference, of four, or Zohar predicts 45 um, people will die at Naran, and you'll see the debate where the literal reading, the conclusion that I got is that the literal reading was referring to an historic event, and not a future event. So it wasn't a prediction, but some are still saying that the number is too coincidental and the location is too coincidental for it not to be on some level related. Do you think it's a tacoon of that event? I, I, I didn't want to verbalize it because it's a bit, um, it's a hubristic for me or you, for a human being to, to have any type of conclusions about what it means. But my hunch is that it's linked. Okay, that's fair. And um, it's uh, it, it's also possible 
to link it more directly, if, if you were to look at it from the perspective of those people on social media I, I ran into that um, were, were slandering the victims. From their perspective, the victims, since they're Haredim, obviously it's, they have some sort of blame for it. Uh, so so that from their perspective, it fits in more, even more with the Zohar. But that is uh, terrifying. It's a complete contradiction of, uh, it's, it's amoral to have to blame the victim and religion to say that uh, the, they are righteous. But if you were to look at the writings of, of, of people who are uh, utterly committed to secularism in, in, in any religious context, uh, including uh, in some parts of the modern state of Israel, uh, they have a, a, a reverence for the secularism and a disdain, uh, a judging unfavorably disdain. Just, uh, can, can I just for, make for a religion. confession? The first thought that came to me is uh, just uh, quick. I, yeah. uh, we don't have confessionals uh, like in Catholicism. <laughs> uh, you, you just have to confess to God, and 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 then re repent for your. Uh, well, I'm not putting it down any money on this one. Uh, okay. But anyway, the, my confession was that my first thought process was that perhaps it was to blame the victim, and to somehow find a way that if they were more. A respectful in this holy site, maybe this would not have happened. That was my initial thought process. And then I had to interrupt myself because I remembered what the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic um, stream uh, or, or way of life, 300 years ago, he taught something that's very, very um, sobering whenever you're about to judge anyone else. He says, that when we cut when after we live leave this world and we are judged by the heavenly court the heavenly court will not be the one to judge us why not because you cannot judge someone the torah they keep the torah too and the torah says that one may not judge someone until you've walked in their shoes until you're in the, you've uh, arrived at their situation and their place do not um, judge your neighbor until you've arrived at their circumstance. And circumstance does not only mean external circumstance, like the same community, but literally birth order, everything, gender, the, every detail is part of circumstance, including in the nature of the, your, the, the individual's uh, internal challenges and psychological challenges and genetics. Therefore, the heavenly court has no authority, according to that, to judge anyone. So what do they do? So they've devised a scheme that throughout our life, we are presented with scenarios that seem to be presenting to us the evil acts or mistake, misdeeds of others. And when, these, uh, when we make an observation about whether the other person should be judged favorably or the opposite, that quote, the, our thought process or our verbalized response to the other person, our judgment that we pass on a wrongdoing that we seem to see in others, then gets saved and archived. And then they'll take the any type of scenario that has the same fundamental elements, they will apply it and they'll say, this is not us judging you. You've already decided that if you see a person doing X, Y, and Z, this is the ruling. This is the verdict. Therefore, I'm very cautious. So he warns everyone, he says, judge everyone favorably, even if at first blush or at first glance, it looks like you should judge them harshly because you're never judging others. You're ultimately judging yourself. You're going to be quoted back. It is going to be quoted back to you when the elements are fundamentally the same, just the superficial uh, uh, look of it might seem different. You know, if, if you look at it from God's perspective, that everything is connected to ethics uh, so that uh, if you're making a right ethical choice, uh, your judgment has a chance to be correct. For example, the, one of the greatest righteous deeds in history can also seem like, like uh, the opposite. The great uh, uh, sacrifice of Isaac by, by Abraham. And 
you know, uh, not to go into a heresy I've heard from people who are, like to insult Avram, you know, uh, but it, they they do they're not judging Avram Avinu favorably with the uh, with the uh, narration of of the uh, the holy act of the um, Akedas Yitzhak, the binding of Isaac. Uh, however, the binding of Isaac was a great righteous act action. The reason is because Avram Avinu followed a clear ethical uh, uh, guideline. Uh, God would never ask me to do something evil. Therefore. I'll trust him completely. And guess what? <laughs> Isaac lived and, and we're people. Uh, so that 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 was true because he followed the Torah. Mm -hmm. In fact, he got to illustrate that our God, the one true God, is against human sacrifice but, by interrupting that process. But the holier the act, the, the also there's so much fuel for someone who hates religion to insult uh, you know, elderly people, uh, like uh, imagine a news article by one, uh, one of these uh, secular extremists. Elderly man takes his son to slay him, but, but the angelic police came there just in time, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, but, you know, it, it's just the, the ex exact opposite of reality. So reality is completely bound to ethics. I have a question about so, the. So therefore, we just have to be sure of the ethics, and then we could make a better judgment. Yes. Uh, since there was the Harim who were suffering and and died, was it a an issue of the less observant of the Torah who were um, blaming the more observant, so that yeah. the less observant didn't have to face the reality of not observing? Well, well, the problem is, is it's revealing. So can, can I can I interrupt that one? I'm the rabbi is going to take the bait there by by feeding into. I'm going to say that nine out of ten rabbis would respond the way Rabbi Friedlander will, but I will respectfully um, disagree and say we don't really know <clears throat> who is from or Haredi truly and who is not. And these are not my words. My rebbe, uh, someone said to the rebbe that my teenage son left the path of observance, of Jewish observance, but he is a very kind man and he's always engaged in acts of goodness and kindness, but he refuses to put on tefillin or keep Shabbat or eat kosher. So the Rebbe turned and interrupted this mother and says to this mother that um, when, when, when the mother said, my son isn't from, from means observant, the Rebbe says, we do not know who is from. And another version I heard is, only God knows who is from. Because um, acts of kindness and charity is part of God's law. In fact, according to many um, sages, it is the whole of the Torah. The, le the rest are just details. And yes. then if someone dresses Haredi style, that to me just evokes the, uh, the restaurant that said kosher style. Kosher style doesn't necessarily mean it's really kosher when you dig down and drill into it. So it's very important um, to judge everyone, whether they're Haredi style or secular style, on a case-by-case -case basis. And only God could really do that. Um, because if someone is doing the best to embrace truth and to pursue truth as they know how, and they were brainwashed from childhood to believe that Haredim are uncivilized and unlawful, and are not really, you know, in pursuit of truth, but just some type of uh, dysfunctional culture, then for them not to pursue the Haredi lifestyle is an act of, I believe, uh, pursuit of truth. Only that they've been misled to believe and generalize and categorize an entire group of people. A perceived truth. A perce yeah. So as long as one's heart is seeking the truth, I believe they're being, and, and is living to the best that they know how. Um, in pursuit of truth, I think that's really the definition of being divine. Divine is truth. Uh, I, I would also beg to differ. Um, if someone was seeking truth and they made a negligent choice and it led to innocent people getting hurt, uh, so they, they have guilt to bear. And it says that um, people will be bringing sacrifices for the sins that they've done. 
uh, when when the basically even those they did accidentally. Yeah, and it even says that about Mashiach. Even Mashiach will bring a sacrifice to the sin he did. Uh, so so therefore, um, uh, so therefore, uh, people are going according to the level. Now we mentioned previously, or right before you came, that uh, in this in today's reading there was. Um, uh, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. The, the phrase, mm -hmm. uh, and and if someone went there not to res respect the spirituality of of, of Rashi, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, one of the students of Rabbi Akiva, whose other students died at this time for disrespecting Torah, uh, if they only went there to party, eat, drink, and be merry, mm -hmm. then for them, That's unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, they were. Uh, Potentially at risk of, of tomorrow they die. Right. right. Um, it, but if they went for spiritual reasons, mm -hmm. so then they had a greater protection. Right. And and that's a question that we we don't know the hearts of okay. individuals. That's a, a God yeah. question, not not a rabbi question. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, uh, but uh, I definitely believe that le next year this time, um, the those who do go there will go as if they're going on hallowed ground, there'll be a lot more sensitivity and, and say a sense of sacred awe for the location that they're at. And I, I think there'll be a lot more civility. And there'll be a lot more mm -hmm. rabbis who, who will say, unless they fix that place, nobody should go there. It's forbidden to go there. Right. It's probably because of danger. Uh, so I, I, right, I, really so. I, I just, I, I, I'm, I just got this feeling that the, the city planners put, um, the ancient stones uh, in, uh, ahead of people. They didn't want to destroy uh, artifacts. But let's and, not blame anybody because well, no, you don't have one entrance to an amphitheater, right? In, but in but nor should times. you allow more than the allowable amount, so it never mm -hmm. becomes. A well, yes, but I mean, even even so, I mean, just in an age of terrorism, what if somebody put a firebomb at, at the other end and they have to escape? Yeah, hindsight I, is 2020. I would like to believe, even though my hunch is that there may, may have been, quote unquote, some secular or anti Haredi types in the police or in the organizing front that sort of look the other way. They're like, oh, let, let them knock themselves out. Perhaps that mm -hmm. may be true because that is unfortunately a mentality. There is a us versus them that pervades that culture, unfortunately. But I would like to believe that this was more of a act of God in the sense that there was no one um, individual who actually um, could be pinpointed responsible, sort of a complex set of, of um, individuals, each one not realizing their contribution to the problem. And therefore, it was more of an, a divinely orchestrated mess. And, and we also made the parable earlier in the class that uh, just like Rabbi Akiva's students, they had Torah protecting them and it did not protect them. These, these were people who potentially were all religious. We don't know. Maybe they were all religious and it didn't protect them from their faith. So we all need God's mercy. We all, we all need to do goodness and kindness. If a person, I, I urge everyone to be good to people because a, a, if a person prays to God, the majority of the merit is for the next world. If a person does a kindness to someone else, it has to come back to them. In if, this world? In this world. Uh -huh. So it, it, the, the, it at least has to reach their, their children or their descendants. It, they cannot get it back. Uh, they cannot not get it back. They must get it back. That's God's system. So being good to others is, is, is huge. So one of the good things you could do is charity. Um, you know, during the, the virus times, I'm not sure where people are living if, if they have a stronger virus But, but charity situation. doesn't have to be um, cash. It could also be a phone call to someone yes. who is lonely. A phone call to someone who's lonely. Also sharing Torah links. Uh, there are many Torah videos out there uh, now, including this one. So share Torah links as well. That's a great way to encourage Torah study and a, 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 do an act of kindness at the very same time. Uh, what was the bait we were talking about? I got confused by that with my question. Where's, where's the what? Uh, what was the bait we were talking about? I got confused with my question about what that. Was the bait? I, I, was, I was simply arguing that 
to, to, to classify an entire group of people based on the way they dress as being observant and those who don't dress Haredi are unobservant. I just felt that that's too simplistic because um, if you're doing a lot of acts of goodness and kindness and pursuing the truth as you best, best know how, even if you don't have the religious trappings, you may in, in, in reality be more observant to God's laws than someone who dresses the dress, but privately or interpersonally is not really refined and is not really pursuing working on themselves towards the, the way God wants them to conduct themselves. That's very I true. I wasn't asking about how they dressed. Right, just in the context of, of that social media conversation I had, uh, th there is a group of people who are, are um, uh, well, uh, hell bent is a perhaps an appropriate uh, uh, description uh, on, on judging the Haredim unfavorably on blaming the victim and um, uh, you know, it, taken to an extreme that, that is ethically uh, frightening, who knows if it, if it had a hand in, in, in this event. But uh, again, logically speaking, if, you, if you're not overwhelmed with, with your love of your, your secular lifestyle, um, if by God's religious ones, they're not safe from God's wrath, then what are you doing? <laughs> get religious, get merciful, get helpful to your fellow human beings. And, and, and uh, no, I, I maybe I didn't understand her question. Uh, no, I, I think she wanted us to have a cool debate. You wanted us to debate. Well, it looks like we ended up agreeing. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> oh, okay. I was just uh, trying to find out, like, since since you said earlier that that the somebody was blaming the Haredim for that. Okay. So I wondered if the blamers were like another sect of Judaism that was like uh, maybe there were reforms and so they think well the Haredi they are too observant so that's their fault there are those who are hostile to the group of people who died bottom yeah. line yeah it, and they're blaming them it, it, it could be a mixture you know it, it could be many many backgrounds it's, it's possible to to uh to be a, a anti-Haredi if, if a person is uh, reform or secular or Haredi. It's possible Haredi to hate a Haredi. We're living in a time when when any uh, any any wrong is possible still. But when Mashiach comes, it's the end of days of evil. Uh, we're guaranteed the goodness and kindness and mercy throughout the world. It's guaranteed, and it's coming soon. The question is not whether people are doing good or bad. The real question is what can we learn from mm -hmm. those. those our focus should not be whether so-and-so should do X, Y, or Z differently, or so-and-so is innocent or guilty. Our main focus has to be, why is God showing that to me in my life? Because I can only control my thoughts, my speech, and my action. So what thoughts, speech, or action corrections or modifications does God expect of me to learn? And, and the thing I wanted to mention about that was that um, just like when I was answering the person who was talking about the, the Holocaust, why didn't God allow that to happen. Uh, so uh, we have to make sure that we were not the people who allowed this to happen. And if we were, we're no longer those people. We're, we're going to be against allowing negligence that could hurt someone else of any background. One line that really stood out for me is be careful in my own life that I'm not trampling at, on someone unwittingly. Mm. Mm. It's so Ooh. easy to emotionally trample on someone without even realizing it. And, and it reminds me of a very cute um, but powerful story, a parable of this guy fell off the boat in the middle of a, middle of a lake and he falls off, his, his boat actually tipped over and he's starting to splash, he's not a good swimmer and it's too deep for him to, to, to he's treading water, he's not going to make it if he doesn't jump back to his boat but it's flipped over and he's trying to get back to it and he's grabbing onto it. He doesn't have a good grip. And in the meantime, he feels someone grabbing his shoulder, pull, trying to push it under the water as if he, the guy, guy is trying to prank him. And he gets really, really angry in his head. As he's trying to survive, he starts cursing the fellow behind him who's trying to push him under the water. And he realizes that they're trying to prank him. They don't realize he can't swim. They're about to kill him. 
the risking his life, and it's not funny at all. And he's full of anger at this individual trying, he's trying to tear off that other person's hand as he's trying to grab on with the other hand to the flipped over boat. He finally steadies himself, he makes it onto his boat, and he realizes that the hand that was trying to shove him under the water was not from some type of prankster or, or, or cool trick at all. It was a second person who also flipped over from the same wave off their boat and they were trying to survive. The moral of the story is that most times that we feel that someone else is attacking us and therefore we're feeling um, anger directed at them, in reality, they are not cruel or trying to attack us at all. They're not trying to drown us at all. They are actually struggling to survive and in desperation end up schlepping you down and being a risk to you. To you. So when someone's attacking us, one lesson to me this is very meaningful is don't see them from your perspective. Hold off and see maybe they are suffering. Maybe they are struggling to survive. Maybe they're in panic. And they, they don't mean to attack you at all. They have nothing against you at all. They don't even see you. They don't recognize what you're going through because they're stuck in their own misery, their own panic. And I think that's really what happened at the Miran situation. No one intended to trample at anyone else. People were just panicking. People were just trying to survive. But in the process, they that fear, when you act out of fear, you make bad decisions. So the key is really, if we're feeling attacked not to rush to judge and to try to see things see instead of the other person as being a villain trying to attack me how are they hurting how are they suffering how can i um, instead of directing defensive or aggression at them maybe they need my help maybe they're they need to survive too they're trying to survive all right and, and uh i guess we'll have to pause it at this point but uh just uh, thanks to hashem for having not just a nice torah class but a nice Torah discussion, uh, Chabura, a, a study group. And uh, thanks for all participants and, and uh, hope that we have even more and more uh, each week. Uh, it's okay if it takes a little bit longer to finish the, the book. If, if we have in, keep increasing the quality of, of the questions and answers, it will be wonderful. Right. Well, thank you, Rabbi. And thank you for your, your guest this evening. He was a good addition. I always enjoy participating when I can. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless. Bye. Be